Hello, in this video we're going to look into the topic of call stack, what it is and how it works. This topic is especially important to understand the concept of recursion and recursive functions. In simple words, call stack is what an application uses to keep track of method calls. It is the memory reserved as a scratch space for an execution thread. This memory is inside the RAM along with the memory heap, which I will explain a little later. It works in a LIFO style, last in first out. And when a function is called or invoked, a stack frame gets added to the call stack and that frame contains all the necessary details to ensure that each function step gets processed accordingly. Let's say we have a function called create student, which creates a student record for our application. It assigns a name and a student ID and then creates a student object. When this function is invoked, within the function body, it calls another function named generate student ID. Don't worry about the, the math flow function for now, it just creates a unique three-digit number for our student. Now, while the student ID is being generated, how does the program know to wait for that response from the generate student ID, and how does it keep track of the function calls? Well, the answer is like we mentioned just now, the call stack. Our create student function would look like this in a call stack when it's executed. Computer adds each function call to the stack, starting from the create student, then generate student ID, and then the call to create the student object. Notice that the actual student object does not get stored in the call stack because there's memory heap for that purpose. Call stack only stores the reference to that student object and the actual object lives inside the heap. So now the memory heap or just the heap also lives inside the RAM along with the call stack and that memory type is used to set aside memory for dynamic allocations. Usually more complex objects are stored in there. The allocation and deallocation of blocks from the heap is random and it does not really have any strict rules unlike in the call stack. But this video is about the call stack, so we will explore the heap topic in another video. Next, let's go through a super simple example to see how the call stack works step by step. We have a very simple function named getSum. It just takes in two numbers and returns the sum of those numbers. And then we have another function called printSum, which chooses the getSum function and just prints the result in the console log. And finally, we have a call to the print some function to start the whole process. How would a call stack handle these variables and function calls? Well, first of all, whenever we see a function invoked, it means that an item gets pushed into the call stack. We start by executing the print some function, which automatically gets added to the stack, and it becomes the active frame because it is at the top of the stack. Each item inside the call stack is called a stack frame. Next, within our print sum function body, there is a call to the get sum function. It sends two and two as the function arguments, and that function call gets added to the top of the stack as well. Notice that the print sum function call pauses while the get sum function tries to add those two numbers, and only the top of the stack becomes active. Eventually, get sum returns the sum of the two numbers, which is four. And when it does, it finishes its mission and it has to be popped off from the call stack because it has no other purpose in the program. Also, notice that only the top frame gets popped each time because we have to reserve the last in, first out order according to the stack data structure rules. So whenever a function returns a value, it accomplishes its purpose and it gets removed from the call stack. Then the return value is going to be printed by using the console log function. That console log function by itself is also another call, therefore it gets added to the stack and becomes the active frame for a moment. When the value gets printed in the console, that functional call also gets popped and we go back to the initial function call, print sum. Since we have performed all the given steps up to subroutines, we can pop the print sum off as well and exit the program. Now, what kind of information is stored in a stack frame? Some systems store different details in stack frames, but typically, a stack frame contains a local variables, arguments that were passed in, information about the caller function's frame, and the address where the result should be returned, which is usually the call function. Since each function call creates its own stack frame, allocating space and memory, it is important to pay attention to the space complexity of programs. This is especially critical when we're dealing with recursion. Now let's see a little more complex example with the recursion. In math, there's a term called factorial, and it's basically the product of all positive integers less than or equal to number n. We're going to try to analyze how the factorial implementation manipulates the call stack. The formula for factorial looks strange, but with some examples, it's pretty clear what it means. For example, the factorial of 3 would be 3 multiplied by 2 and then 1, which gives us number 6. Factorial of 4 would be 4 multiplied by 3, then by 2, and then by 1, which equals 24, and so on. Let's implement it in code now. The factorial function has two main logical sections. The first one checks if the input number is equal to 1. If it is, it returns number 1. 
otherwise it returns the product of n multiplied by n minus 1 factorial. Let's start actually going through the code and it will be more clear. So we also have a console log call here to print the result of the factorial calculation. So console log call gets added to the call stack first. Within the console log, we are also invoking the factorial function with the parameter number of 4. So that call will be pushed to the top of the stack next. Notice that the stack frame before the factorial 4 call is going to be paused until some response is returned. Inside the factorial 4 function body, we check if the n is equal to 1. Well, in this case, the input is equal to 4. So we move to the else part. There, the function recursively calls itself with slightly different input, n minus 1, which is 3. And then we add the factorial 3 call to the top of the stack. We check if the input is equal to 1. It's not. So it goes to the else section again. And it repeats the last two steps until the factorial of 1 gets called recursively. When that happens, the first section of the logic becomes true because n is actually going to be equal to 1 this time. Up until this point, we have not returned any response for any of the function calls, and all of the stack frames under the top of the stack are on pause at this time and waiting for some return value. Factorial of 1 is going to be the first one to return any value. And according to the logic we have here, when that input is equal to 1, we return number 1. That in turn, fulfills the steps for the previous function call, factorial of 2. Once we have all the pieces for the factorial 2 call, we calculate that 2 multiplied by 1 and is equal to 2, so we return that number for the previous caller. So that keeps going until the starting factorial of 4 function call gets resolved. Notice that whenever we return a value, we are popping that function from call stack because that function has accomplished its purpose. Finally, we get the result to print inside of the console log as soon as the number 4 is printed, the console log also gets popped off from the stack and we exit the program. I hope this video was able to give you at least some understanding of the call stack. In our next video, we'll look into the memory heap and its nuances. Thanks for watching and have a great one.